If you will turn in your Bibles to the fifth chapter of the book of Hebrews as we continue our study through the Word. So you'll remember that Hebrews was written to those Jewish Christians that had accepted Jesus as the Messiah. But as persecution from the other Jews that did not share that belief entered in, and as they continued to face opposition and difficulty in their lives, they began to second guess, began to have double-minded thoughts about maybe life would be easier, and by easier than better, if we just returned back to worshiping at the temple, at the temple. How simple life was back then. And so the writer of Hebrews writes this letter now as an exhortation to them to continue to press forwards into the fullness of what God has for you. And so you'll remember that this book began with this glorious depiction, description of Jesus Christ. And then after that begins to compare and contrast the old covenant with the new covenant, began by first talking about the mediator of those two covenants. In the old covenant, it was angels that mediated between God and Moses. In the new covenant, it was Jesus who is our mediator. And so the superiority of Jesus over the angels, the angels that Jesus created. And so he is over all. Second, we saw that there was a compare and contrast now between the high priests. Uh, and we see that Jesus uh, is our high priest. And we see that Aaron was the high priest over the old covenant. And so we have a comparison between Aaron and between Jesus. And so that again goes to the new covenant. And then there was the comparison of the apostles of the old covenant versus the new covenant. Now, the apostle of the old covenant, the one who was sent out to lead God's people out of bondage, that was Moses uh, there in Egypt. But we see in the new covenant uh, that it was Jesus Christ who was sent from heaven to earth to lead mankind out of the bondage of sin and death. And so Jesus is the apostle of the new covenant. So in those three areas, in the area of mediator, in the area of high priest, in the area of apostle, it's Jesus, 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 check, you know. And so here we are in the superiority. And then there was the exhortation that we had of the children of Israel, how they came out of Egypt, but then they kind of got stuck out in the wilderness and didn't enter into the fullness of what God had. And so also these Hebrew Christians, they had come into the body of Christ, into the family of God, but now they were thinking about maybe going back and not pressing all the way forward. And so we saw the exhortation to learn from the past, learn from the history, learn from the forefathers, not to get stuck, but to to continue to follow God and to press into the fullness of what he has. Now, as we come to this fifth chapter, we see that one of the concepts that was a radical new, like mind-bending concept to the Hebrew Christians was the fact that the Messiah could be a priest. Now, that was something that was just completely new to them. Jesus never ministered there in the temple. He never carried out any of the, uh, of the sacrifices and the priestly functions that were there at the altar. And so they never saw Jesus in that capacity, but they also never understood it from the scriptures how it was even possible that the Messiah could also be a priest. Now, they expected that the Messiah was going to be king, and they expected that the Messiah was going to be prophet. He was going to be a mighty prophet like Moses, and him you shall hear. And they expected that the Messiah was going to be the son of David, that he would be seated upon the, the throne of righteousness, and that he would come as the lion from the tribe of Judah. So he would come and have to have the lineage of Judah. Why? Because David came from the tribe of Judah and the son of David, the promise was that the Messiah was going to come through the seed of David. So he would have to be from the tribe of Judah. But 
you will remember that the priests, they all had to come from one tribe only, and that was from Levi. The Levites were the priests. And so how could it possibly be that the Levites now, that the the Messiah could be both from the tribe of Judah and also be from the tribe of Levi? And so this concept, now he talks about the comparison of the high priests, uh, you'll remember, and then he mentions Melchizedek, but that was only in the comparison of the high priest. And now what he does in this fifth chapter is he kind of hits the brakes, sees the puzzled look on the Hebrews' faces, you know, Christians about talking about how the Messiah is a, a priest. And now he's going to back up and say, let's dig this out a little bit further for you and help you to understand how Jesus is the high priest in the new covenant and how this was shown. Remember, they're Jews now. This was shown in the Old Testament. And so he's going to go back and show them now from the Old Testament uh, how Jesus qualifies as the high priest as he had made this comparison of the two high priests. After he does that, in this fifth chapter, we're going to see that he's then going to just pause completely for a minute. And he is going to, in the rest of the fifth chapter and into the sixth chapter, he is going to talk about the necessity of growing in our faith to spiritual maturity, that we need to be men and women of the word of God that understand not just the superficial, but are able to enter into fully into what our faith means and who we are and our identity in Christ Jesus. And then in chapter seven, he's going to jump back to Aaron and Melchizedek, the two uh, typologies of the priesthood, and continue to move forward. But this fifth chapter, fabulous chapter, let's jump in now, verse one. He has just been talking about the fact that we have a, a compassionate high priest who can understand us in all of our weaknesses. But as he has talked about our compassionate high priest here in this fifth chapter, we are going to see the qualifications uh, for uh, our high priest priest. And so verse one, it says, for every high priest taken from among men is appointed for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. So a prophet and a priest, two different functions. Remember underneath the uh, old covenant that there were three offices. There was the king, the prophet, and the priest. Now the prophet, he stands before God's people and speaks on behalf of God to God's people. That's the role of the prophet. The role of the priest is that he stands before God on behalf of God's people, and he represents God's people now before God. And so different viewpoints now and different representations. So as the priest, for every high priest now that's going to represent man before God, it says that he is taken from among men. In other words, if you are going to represent this group, you have to be from this group. So the person has to be, you know, one of the group that he is representing. Therefore, the high priest, since he is representing man, he has to be a man. And so that's the point that every high priest is selected, is taken from among men. He's appointed now in the things that are pertaining to God to be able to offer up the gifts and sacrifices. Verse 2, that he can have compassion on those who are ignorant and going astray, since he himself is also subject to weakness. So one aspect of having a representative is that they understand you, that they understand your trials and your difficulties and your hardships. And so having a representative of man before God as our high priest, they can understand our weaknesses and our trials. He goes on in verse 3, and because of this, he is required, as for the people, so also for himself, to offer sacrifices for sins. So what the writer of Hebrews is doing right now is he is talking about the high priest underneath the old covenant and the way that he was taken from before, from amongst a man that he understands us in our weaknesses, but also it says that 
he has to go and offer sacrifices, not only as the representative, but also for himself as well. Why? Because the high priest is a man. And so he also is a sinner, just like everybody else. And before he was allowed to officiate as the representative in the function of the high priest, he had to first go deal with his own sins. The high priest underneath the Mosaic law, you remember, once a year on the Day of Atonement, he would go into the Holy of Holies. That was the one time a year that the high priest was allowed to enter in behind the veil. And inside of the Holy of Holies, that's where the mercy seat was and the Ark of the Covenant. And inside the Ark of the Covenant, remember that there's the three things that are in there. There were the Ten Commandments, the Tablets of Stone. There was also Aaron's rod that budded. And then there was the golden pot of manna. And those were inside the Ark of the Covenant. The mercy seat sat over that. And what he would do is he would offer the prescribed sacrifice and then he would bring the blood of the sacrifices in on behalf of the nation. He would sprinkle it over now the mercy seat, and then he would back, back out again. He would do that once a year. But before he was allowed to go in as the high priest and to officiate that, he first had to go get himself cleansed. He first had to go offer his personal sacrifices that would take care of his own sin. And so here we see that even the high priest, it says, uh, would uh, offer sacrifices uh, for the people and also for himself to offer sacrifices for sins. Now, he's going to be making a contrast between Jesus and, of course, Jesus as having no sin at all, never needed to make a sacrifice uh, for himself, but every other high priest uh, had to do that. He says in verse 4, and no man takes this honor to himself, but he who is called by God, just as Aaron was. And so here he talks about the fact that a high priest wasn't a position that you could covet. It wasn't a position that you got because you desired it or you felt that you were qualified for it. You didn't get to put a resume in and then show your qualifications. It was an appointment from God. God is the one who would choose who is going to represent man before him. And you'll remember that God chose Aaron in the same way that God also chose Moses. But the children of Israel, they challenged that, if you'll remember. In Numbers chapter 16, as the children of Israel had been led out of Egypt and they got out now into the wilderness, the leaders began to talk amongst themselves, the different tribes, and they were like, hey, how did Moses become the boss of all of us uh, here? How did he become the, the leader? Aren't we tribes? Aren't we qualified? Aren't we good leaders here? And did you notice what he did? Not only did is he in charge of everybody, but he took his brother and made him the high priest. Isn't that called nepotism uh, here? And so what's going on here? Is there nobody else that was qualified? And, uh, and so now they confront uh, Korah leads this rebellion against Moses and gets all of the, uh, the leaders together to confront Moses and to say, hey, we think that, uh, that we're qualified here to be able to be in leadership uh, as well. And, and it says that they rose up before Moses with some of the children of Israel, 250 leaders of the congregation, representatives of the congregation, men of renown, and they gathered together against Moses and Aaron and said to them, you take too much upon yourselves, for all the congregation is holy. We're all <laughs> holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Why then do you exalt yourself above the assembly of the Lord? And so how did Moses uh, handle that when they came and they said that, you know, you, you need to share in the leadership? Moses just simply said this. He says, okay, everybody who's with Korah, you guys go stand over there. And 
everybody that's with me, you come and stand over here. And so 250 leaders and all of their families, they all go over, the chief prominent people, they all go over with Korah, and the rest of the people are over there with Moses. And then all of a sudden, the earth opened up and swallowed all of the 250 families right into the ground and then closed up afterwards. It doesn't say this, but I think Moses then asked, any questions? <laughs> Moses never wanted to do what, what he was doing. Remember how he got appointed? He was a shepherd out in the wilderness. Uh, and all of a sudden he sees that there's a bush that's on fire. And he goes over to investigate it and the bush starts talking to him. Remove the sandals from your feet for the ground upon you with its holy ground. And God is the one that appointed Moses and called him. And God is the one that then chose and said, Levi, and the tribe of Levi, they are the ones that are going to be the priests and the high priests that are going to represent for me. It is true back then with God's appointments, and it is true even today within the church and the body of Christ that, that being in ministry is an appointment from God. It is a calling from God. It doesn't matter how much a person desires to be in ministry. It doesn't matter what their qualifications look like and, and what their resumes uh, look like. It is a calling from God that he puts upon the hearts of men and women to now step in and to serve him. And so these are appointments uh, from God, God's invitation for us to draw near and to serve him. And so we see here in these first four verses that what the writer of Hebrews has done is he's shown us what the qualifications were for being the high priest. And so number one, he says the priest had to be human, had to be from mankind. Number two, that he had to function as a priest in the offering up of sacrifices. Third, that he had to be compassionate and sympathetic and able to identify. And finally, fourth, he had to be called by God. He had to be appointed by God. It couldn't be a self-appointment. And now what he's going to do in the next few verses is he's going to show that Jesus meets each one of those four qualifications of a high priest. Now, the writer of Hebrews isn't going to take it in the same order that he just listed this out, but in the next few verses, he's going to hit those four points so that the four qualifications we're going to see, each one of those are going to be checked off here in the next couple of verses. So verse 5. So also Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest. First issue that he deals with is whether or not Jesus appointed himself or whether or not God appointed uh, him. And so here he starts off and he says that Jesus did not glorify himself to become high priest, but it was he who said to him, you are my son, and today I have begotten you. That comes out of Psalm 2, verse 7, and then verse 6. As he also says in another place, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. And so here we see that in Psalm 2, he is declaring that he has been chosen by the Father. You are my son. So that is the choosing. And then we also see that he appoints him to the priesthood there in Psalm 1, but you are a priest forever now, according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, Melchizedek is interesting because Melchizedek, you're going to find back in the book of Genesis. And in there, we find uh, that, remember that the concept of Messiah as prophet and king, that was something that they were comfortable with. But what they weren't comfortable with and what they hadn't understand is how the Messiah could function as a priest. And so here we see that in the scriptures, in the psalm, it tells them that the Messiah is going to be a priest, not after the order of Aaron, which means that he would have to be from the tribe of Levi, but that he is going to be a priest and a high priest after another order of priesthood. Now, this other order of priesthood, it predated Moses and the Torah and the law that was given at Sinai. It goes all the way back to Abraham. 
And what happened, you'll remember in the story, is that uh, Abraham's nephew Lot was living in uh, Sodom at the time, and there were the kings that had banded together and came in and they raided Sodom and Gomorrah and some of the surrounding cities. And they took everybody, they were victorious, they took everybody captive, and off they went. So Abraham's nephew, suddenly now, he is a part of the captivity that is being taken away. And so Abraham mounts up his own servants, and they go and they do a night raid, and they overthrow the kings that had come out against Sodom and Gomorrah, and they rescue all of the people, and then all of the, uh, of the bounty that had been collected and taken, but recover all of that, and he's bringing it back. And as he's bringing it back, he runs into Melchizedek. Now, Melchizedek was the king of Salem, the king of Jerusalem, who was also the high priest of the Most High God. So here we have high priest that is joined together with the office of king. And so this is the order of priests. And what does Abraham do? Abraham offers up tithe. He gives a 10%, a tithe of all that he had just brought back. And he gives that, worships God, and gives that to Melchizedek. And so we see Abraham, who is the father of the faithful, of the Jewish nation, we see that he paid his tithe, the nation of Israel paid tithe before a different high priest, not the high priest of Aaron that comes later, but the high priest now of Melchizedek. And this is who Abraham... now. Jesus is a high priest after the order of Melchizedek, of king high priest collected together. And this he is showing the Hebrews. This goes all the way back to their own history. Melchizedek isn't something that, that they're not familiar with. They are familiar. They just didn't recognize and understand that he was a prefigure and a prototype of the high priest of Christ Jesus. And so here we see now in verse 7 that it says, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear. So the second prerequisite, you will remember here, Jesus was human. He was fully human. And so it says in verse 7, who in the days of his what? In the days of his flesh, that refers to his incarnation. He's fully God, but he was fully man. And so he was able to be taken as our representative because he was fully man. And so now verse 8, it says, Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And so here is the third prerequisite, and that was he was compassionate. He learned obedience. He entered into suffering as well, and so he is able to identify with us. Verse 9, and having been perfected, he became the author of eternal life to all who obey him, called by God as high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. And so here we see that the fourth prerequisite is that Jesus functions in the priestly order. And so here now he has shown the qualifications for a high priest, and he has shown now that Jesus matches those qualifications as high priest. Now, as he's talking to them, he kind of pauses right here now and is going to, to now change subjects for a second and talk to them about spiritual maturity, talking to them about needing to grow in the scriptures and their understanding of the scriptures. They're waiting for, the Jews are waiting for Messiah and Jesus is the Messiah, but they didn't have the depth of knowledge, the order of Melchizedek, the things that he is taking them into right now. And so we see here that he says in verse 11, of whom we have much to say and hard to explain since you have become what? Dull of hearing. He says, you know, that these are deep things and I want to talk to you about these deep, deep things. The deep things of how Christ fulfills all of the typologies of the Old Testament of the Old Covenant. He says that you become dull of hearing. He says in verse 12, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk 
and not solid food. Ouch. <laughs> Here he is. Remember who he's writing to? He's writing to the Hebrews. These are the ones that had the scriptures from the time that they were this high. These are the, the, the boys that learned Hebrew to speak it and to read it so that they could handle the scriptures. These are the people who were God's people, who were delivered out of Egypt, and they were God's chosen, and they now have the scriptures. So in the church, remember, the early church, there were the Gentiles, and the Gentiles didn't know anything about the Scriptures. They had no knowledge or understanding of what was in the, uh, in the Old Testament or in the Scriptures of the Jews. But the Jews, they had all of the rich history of their nation and of God's revelation to them underneath. And so they had been waiting for the Messiah, and Jesus is the Messiah, and now they have entered into that. But they never understood the fullness of Christ in the Old Testament. And so this is why he is now saying that by this time, you should be the teachers. Who should be handling the scriptures? He's talking about in the early church, the Gentiles who don't know any scripture at all, or the Jews who were raised with the scripture and that Jesus is the fulfillment of that. He says, now, but you've come yourselves to need milk and not enter into solid food. He says, verse 13, for everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. And so here we see that again, the solid meat, the solid food, they weren't able to understand and to handle the deep things of the word of God, just the superficial. He says in verse 14, but solid food belongs to those who are of full age. That is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. And so solid food versus milk. A mature believer, they are able to have an unrestricted diet. They, they can eat the meat, they can drink the milk, they can enjoy the fullness of what is there. But uh, those now who are not of full age, uh, he says, they're not able to. And this is really where I want to just uh, close our study, and I want to deal with this verse now as our attention, because he says here uh, that, the, the ability is to be able to discern, listen to this, to discern good and evil. So being able to tell what is good and what is evil, how are we able to do that? Today we are living in a culture that everyone will agree is radically shifting right before our eyes. Whatever direction is heading, what we can all agree upon is, is that it is radically changing right in front of our eyes. And so the issue is uh, how do we recognize what's good and what's evil? He says that in order to be able to tell that, in order to be able to discern to know the difference between good and evil, that this comes by first knowing the word of God and then exercising the word of God and growing in the word of God to where now we are able to discern good from evil. He says, by this time, I would have expected that you're going to be meat eaters. But instead, he says, man, you still need milk. You're still at the elementary. We've got to go back to our ABCs and start all over and just start right there. And that reminded me. It reminded me of a conversation that I had with my dad when I was a young man. And, and it was time to do an employee review and to look at a, a salary and whether or not there should be a raise that was given or not given. And the, the person that was being reviewed was a person that had 20 years experience. And I remember my dad turned to me and he said, I want you to know, son, he says, I want you to know that there's a difference between a person who has 20 years of experience, he says, versus the person that has one year of experience, 20 years repeated. That 
hasn't continued to grow, hasn't gotten better at their job. They're, they're now functioning at the end of one year. They had learned everything they had learned. They're not doing it any better. They're not doing it any smarter, not being any more productive. They are just simply that one year of experience has now just been simply repeated over and over and over and over and over again. He said, versus the person that's growing, expanding their skill set, they're more valuable, they're able to do more, they're able to handle more responsibility. He says, and so that's the difference between 20 years of experience and one year of experience, just 20 years repeated. And as believers, I think that we can ask ourselves the very same question. We, we can say we've been a Christian for 20 years. And the question that we would say is, okay, that's awesome. Is that one year of a Christian just a 20-year repetition? Because we can fall into that to where Christianity just becomes a routine. We, just, we get into our routine, but we're not growing. We're not growing in knowledge. We're not growing in grace. We're not growing in truth. We're not seeing our lives being radically transformed. Everything is just kind of status quo. Or... We see the person who is being changed by the word of God. The word of God changes us as, as we, it is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And as we begin to handle the word of God, we are shaped and formed. It is the instrument that God uses to change our lives and our hearts. And so here we see that, that the question is, that he's bringing out is this. We need to be able, in order to discern good from evil, we need to be growing, not just maintaining this superficial relationship, but we need to be growing in the Word of God to understand who God is and to understand the revelation of truth that is within our lives. Why? I think more so than any time in history, it is imperative for us to know the difference between good and evil. Why? Why? Because in our culture today, what's happening right around us is, is that our culture is redefining the meaning of everything. It's redefining the words. It's redefining what is good, what is normal, what is healthy, what is acceptable for us as a culture and as a nation. And these are the very things that, that are being redefined by the experts. And the question is, who's defining now? Is this good or is this bad? Is this good or is this evil? We're living in a time when they said there is no such thing as truth. And since we've done away with truth, this is what we're telling you is in the best interest of everybody. And suddenly now we're being handed all of these changes. And how do we discern what is good from what is evil? I want you to know the, 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 the replacement of good with evil this isn't a new tactic from the enemy. I want you to know if you will look up in his playbook, Satan's playbook, it's actually play number one. <laughs> it's the very first one. It was there in the garden when he starts to have a conversation with Eve. And what happens by the end of that conversation, he has Eve convinced that evil is good and that good is evil, that God, he's not been treating you right. You've been thinking he's been treating you good. He's not. He's been holding out on you. He doesn't want you to be like him and everything. And he convinces her that evil is good and good is evil. How do we know in the voices and the landscape and all that is going on around us, how do we know what is good and what is evil? It is in the word of God. While our culture is changing and definitions are changing and the voices are swirling around us, I want you to know the word of God has never changed. Amen. It is the revelation of truth that is in our lives. And as we dive into it and are tethered to it, this is what helps us to recognize and understand good from evil. And it says not just a, a, a cursory overview, not just sipping on the milk of the word of God, but digging in and recognizing the importance. It is more important, the Word of God, I believe in today, because of the environment, the hostile environment that we are living in, and the radical changes that are going on around us, to be able to stand solid, we need to be standing solid on the Word of God. And so diving in, digging in, it's this exercising, not not just looking at the gym equipment. There's a difference between the person who goes into the gym and looks around 
and leaves and said, I went to the gym. <laughs> I might be one of those people. I'm just saying, you know, versus the person that gets in there and actually, man, exercises, you know, and uses the, the, the equipment. And so we don't want to just come into church and look around and say, yay, the word of God, you know, we want to get in here and grow. Why? Because we need to be able to discern from evil from good. And God is the one that teaches and helps us to recognize and understand through the word of God what is good and what's evil. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word that leads us and guides us into righteousness. God, we don't want one year of Christianity 20 times repeated. Lord, we want to grow. Your word tells us that you're looking for those who will worship you in spirit and in truth, Lord. And so, Father, help us. Create a hunger. Salt our tongues, Lord, for your word, that you would help us to, to dive in and to meet you. You promised to meet us in the word of God and to change us through your word. So, Father, we thank you for that. Help us, Lord, and bless us. In Jesus' name we pray.